I invite you to turn to uh, Psalm 74. Psalm 74. We continue in our study of the Psalms for a little while. We'll be reading from all 23 verses. Psalm 74, verse 1. O God, why do you cast us off forever? And why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in the forest of trees. and all its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There's no longer any prophet, and there's none among us who knows how long. How long, O God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave them as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of land are full of the habitations of violence. Do not let the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this reading of your word. We thank you, Father, for your word which instructs us. And Father, we ask, O Lord, that you'd be pleased to teach us from your word this morning, that you'd be pleased, O Father, to bless us through the instruction that's herein. And Father, we pray for the work of the Holy Spirit to lie in our hearts, O oh Father, that we may think these thoughts after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Of all the books in my library, it was quite a few books. I need to purge and really make some shelf space for other things. But in all of the books in my library, I have to say that one of my favorite books is this little book right here by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which I picked up recently. I picked it up over Christmas. Found it at Barnes and Noble. It was wonderful to see this um, on the shelves um, as I was looking through the the religion section. Um, it's rough. Um, Christianity section is rough, uh, and uh, this was a, a just a great gem. This was um, originally published by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the German language in 1940, and then it was translated into English in um, I think 73 or 74. And what it, it's entitled Psalms, the prayer book of the Bible. And what Dietrich Bonhoeffer is doing is he's, he's calling people to, to, to return to praying through the Psalms. And, and some of us say, well, that don't sound like anything new. I mean, it's a spiritual discipline that probably most of us are familiar with. And maybe some of us make a habit of doing or we say we're going to start doing it. And at least we start for a while. Um, we do fall off the wagon once in a while, don't we? Um, but some of the insights here, and of course, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is really, I, I, don't, I think most of this work actually is really standing on the shoulders of Martin Luther, who loved music and understood the importance of and place of the Psalms in the life of the Christian, and how uh, Luther would often point how the Lord's Prayer is related to the Psalter and how the Psalter is related to the Lord's Prayer, where the Lord's Prayer is a summation, if you will, of the Psalter. And, and uh, Bonhoeffer brings this up, and, 
And it's not so much that this little book has a bunch of nuggets in it as this little book teaches you where you find the nuggets in the Scriptures. And it's a great little work. And one of the things that I so appreciated about this um, work, it's an easy read, it's a short read, and one of the things that I so appreciated about this was Bonhoeffer pointed to the fact that oftentimes when we pr- want to pray through the, the Psalms, we'll spend time rooting through the Psalter, looking for a Psalm that seems to reflect the mood we're in or the particular circumstances that we're in. Some of you are smiling. You're like, yeah, that's how it goes. And you know, too often it's the case you exhaust all your time for prayer looking for some Psalm to pray through. And, and, <laughs> and what... What Bonhoeffer is saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Start with Psalm 1. Do Psalm 1 today. Do Psalm 2 tomorrow. Or when you come to shorter Psalms, like Psalm 23, do Psalm 23 and 24 in the same day so that you're working through the Psalter um, once, preferably maybe twice a year to where you're really taking in uh, the prayer book, if you will, of the Bible and this is really um, how the Lord teaches us uh, to pray. And I thought that was a wonderful insight. And what else I thought was, okay, uh, Bonhoeffer's writing in 1940. It's published in 1940. could have been writing in the late 30s, for all we know. And he's speaking of a problem that existed in Europe in the late 30s, early 40s, and the problem's still with us now. And I think that's really interesting um, So, okay, we're going to start with Psalm 1. We're going to pray through the Psalms sequentially. What do you do when you get to Psalm 74? You know, I was thinking of this. What does the mother of three do when she's praying through Psalm 74? Um, What's Psalm 74 all about? Well, it's a a community lament. Why do we know it's a community lament? Notice the pronoun in verse 1. Oh, God. It doesn't say, oh, God, why do you cast me off forever? It says, oh, God, why do you cast us off forever? So we have a singer who is a representative of, guess what? A congregation. We have the word congregation in verse 2. Here's that word, congregation. That's the assembly. It's what we were talking so much about last week, the importance of gathering. You know, when when the translators, the Greek translators came to this uh, to translate the Hebrew into into Greek, um, they translated the Hebrew, uh, which we have congregation from, uh, with the word synagogue, which is the word we get synagogue from, which is interesting. A synagogue is a place where worship takes place. It's a gathering. It's an assembly. And here the singer is representing the gathering. It's representing the assembly. It's representing the people. And he says, why do you cast us off forever? It's a lament. It's a community lament. But what is it lamenting? It's lamenting a national catastrophe. What national catastrophe? The destruction of the temple. So back to my question, what does the mother of three or the father of two or the father in some cases of ten? <laughs> we know a father of ten, I think ten, right? I think we know a father that's got ten children. Um, how, does, how do we pray through this psalm? What does a national catastrophe that involves the complete destruction of the temple uh, how does that speak to our situation today? What truths are, are universal? What truths are timeless that would come from this psalm that, that could coach our prayer life? And that's what I want to take up this morning. Does that make sense? And I think as we simply go through the psalm and begin to explain the psalm, I think a lot of these questions are going to get answered. So let's look. Notice in verse 1, the psalmist says, "'Why do you cast us off forever?' Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Now, the reader of the Old Testament, especially if we're familiar at all with the book of Deuteronomy and sees the language smoking, anger smoking, um, that sounds like breaching the covenant, doesn't it? It sounds like God's response of breaching the covenant. You can think of Deuteronomy 28 where there's covenant blessings and covenant curses that are spelled forth there. And, of course, running behind us. Why has God allowed the temple to be destroyed? It's the result of covenant breach on behalf of of the people of God. And though that sin is not mentioned in this psalm, which is peculiar, uh, it's certainly running in the background. Uh, It's definitely running in the background. And the psalmist is saying, listen, why do you cast us off forever? Now, 
Now, within the apostasy of the people of God at that time, keep in mind there's still a faithful remnant. And that faithful remnant is enduring all these hardships along with those who have breached the covenant. And they're saying, God, ooh, how long? I mean, how long? Are you going to cast us off forever? Now, I have learned a little bit, kind of the hard way, that I'm going to have to start introducing some of the, the song illustrations that I use. You know, on our Christmas kickoff, we had a young teenager with us and, and uh, just making conversation. She wasn't participating in the games and stuff, and she was just kind of standing there, her and her friend. So I was making conversation with her, and one, what do you ask? You know, I asked her, I said, what's your name? And she said, um, Layla. And I had met her father earlier, and I thought, Layla, I just wonder. I said, you know, there, I said to her, I said, there's a famous song called Layla. And she went, really? I said, have you ever heard of it? No. I said, and she goes, well, who sings it? I said, well, um, Eric Clapton. She went, who's that? I'm like, oh, Rick, <laughs> you, you, you're, I, Harry, I knew you'd love that one. I mean, um, you know, it's like we have to, st I'm, I'm, I'm really reaching a point in my life now where I'm going to have to start introducing, you know, if I mention Gordon Lightfoot, some of us might know who Gordon Lightfoot is, some of us might not, and he was a folk singer, and one of his most famous Probably one of his most famous songs was The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And it's, it's, the song is, the lyrics in the song are very masterful, and it speaks of a freighter ship going down in one of the Great Lakes in a November storm. And one of the lines goes like this. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn minutes to ours. Did you catch that? And some of you can hear the haunting melody behind that right now, can't you? Music is so powerful. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn minutes to hours? That's what's being reflected here in verse 1. Do you cast us off forever because a minute feels like an hour, Lord, and hours feel like days? And that's the language of suffering, isn't it? That's the language of suffering. In verse 2, we have covenantal language. You know, the word covenant appears more than 200 times in the Bible, but there are so many other places where the word covenant doesn't appear, but covenant language is all over it. He says in verse 2, speaking for the congregation, speaking as the representative of the congregation, he says, remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Think of the covenant, the covenant of God, the covenant that runs from, from one end of Scripture to the other. You know, we, if, if we ignore this, we're not going to interpret Scripture properly. I mean, this is really how Scripture is to be interpreted because the covenant is everywhere. What is the covenant? God covenants to bring a people to himself. He says... I will be your God, you shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. And you can see that covenant language right there. These are the people God has purchased from of old. They are the offspring of Abraham. Abraham was promised offspring, numerous offspring. In fact, that comes from Genesis 3.15. You can see we've spent many, many mornings actually studying that. And uh, the Lord has purchased them out of Egypt when they became slaves in Egypt. He's purchased them out of, out of Egypt. He's redeemed them uh, to be the tribe of your heritage. And remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Mount Zion, the temple, namely, is the place where God has been pleased to cause his name to dwell. You shall be my people, I will be your God, and I will dwell in your midst. It's covenantal language. So what is the singer doing? Representing the congregation, he's speaking the language of suffering. Um, he's also appealing to the fatherly, um, the fatherly heart of God. He says, he says, why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? That's why we read from Psalm 23 where the Lord says, I, you know, where the Lord speaks of, or where the psalmist speaks of the Lord being our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's an endearing um, passage where the singer is appealing to the, 
fatherly heart of God? Why does your anger smoke against your people, against the apple of your eye, against your congregation who you're in covenant with? Verse 3, direct your steps to the ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Can you imagine how painful this would be for a faithful follower of the Lord during this time? In verses 4 through 11, we we get a long recap of what has happened. If you look at verse 4, your foes, these are the enemies of the gospel. They have come and roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. What does that mean? It's a little bit obscure. They've set up their own signs for signs. What's that about? Probably this. When the temple is, was, was operating correctly, what was going on in the temple? Sacrifices were being offered. Ritual purification was taking place. The various things, the altar, the sea of labor, uh, the candelabra, the candle in the temple, all of these things are actually signs pointing to the work of Jesus Christ, aren't they? All of those things would serve as a sign. The priesthood itself served as a sign pointing to uh, Jesus as high priest. All of these things. We could spend a couple of Sundays on all of these things. These things are gone. And they've set up their own signs in their place. What might those signs be? Probably a Babylonian flag. For most scholars place the historical context of this psalm in 587-86 BC when Babylon comes in and destroys the temple. There's a minority of views where it uh, pushes this off in history to the second century when Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and desecrates the temple. Uh, less people uh, would, I, I, you know, would have that view, but I don't think it matters because it speaks when this happens any time. We can see that it's timeless. Um, but I think the historical context is, is probably the 587, 586 B.C. Under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon comes in and destroys uh, the temple. And they probably set up their flag, showing their superiority, showing their sovereignty. And they probably brought in in various insignia of their pagan gods, and they're bringing them in. Imagine somebody coming in and sacking this place and then bringing in all of their uh, their other things, uh, you know, bringing in the various signs of the world's religion and posting them all over the place in here. That's what's going on. In verse 5, They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees. And all its carved wood, they broke down with hatchets and hammers. Well, this is is barbarous that's taking place here. Um, By the time of 587, 86 B.C., the temple was an ancient building. It was an old building by that time. And um, imagine, it's probably in excess of 400 years old by that time, and imagine going into a, a building that's, been around since the late 1500s, early 1600s. It's full of this beautiful woodwork and beautiful artisanship and just going in there with hatchets and hammers and crowbars and whatever you can get and just vandalizing the place into ruins. You know, that's barbarous. It's it's beastly to do such a thing. But more so, this was a sacred place. This is the place where God had chosen for His name to dwell. It was a holy place. Here the psalmist is saying, look, Lord, look what they've done. Verse 7, they set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. Notice what the psalmist is doing. The psalmist is saying, Lord, your honor's on the line. They are defaming you, O God. And there we're starting to already discover, how can we pray? Notice the, 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 the way the psalmist is leading us to pray here is appealing to the glory of God. You're being defamed, Lord. You're being defamed by these violent acts that these folks have done. Verse 8, they said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all of the meeting places of God in the land. Well, here we see it's one step further. It's not so much just to vandalize the temple. It's not so much to burn the temple to the ground, but they're trying to snuff out worship services wherever they're going. You know, from the prophets, we learned that there were services held after the temple was destroyed. And th- these services probably utilized Psalm 74 as for its liturgy. And here the enemy is trying to stamp out these services so that there is no worship being offered to the Lord our God. Now I think we're starting to really see how we can pray this psalm. Because I think already we're saying, you know, the more things... Um, change, the more they stay the same, don't they? 
Now, look at verse 9. Verse 9 is so interesting. We do not see our signs. Okay, those signs have been taken away. But then, he's, then the singer says, there's no longer any prophet. And there is none among us who knows how long. One of the um, sorest aspect, I think, for the faithful during this time is the fact that God went prophetically silent during that time. I mean, you have Ezekiel, you have Jeremiah, you have a few others, but they're carried away. So now there's no prophet. What is the role of the prophet? The role of the prophet would have been to give a word from God to the people. And what would, they, what would you want to have? You'd want to know how long. Lord, when are you going to restore this thing? They'd want to know how long. But another role of the prophet, and this is, this is the everyday nuts and bolts role of the prophet, is to proclaim the word of God that has already been given. We need to understand that. And someone said, well, wait a second. So what are you saying? They weren't teaching the Bible. No. No one's teaching the Bible. Uh-oh. Now we really can understand how to apply this, can't we? Well, that's going on wholesale all over the place, isn't it? I can't tell you how many times I've bumped into somebody out in public somewhere and, and they've said, you know, our church doesn't teach the Bible. Our pastor doesn't teach the Bible. He doesn't teach the Word. And if my first thought is, what are you doing there? Why do you continue to stay there? Why do you bring your family and your, your why do you bring your children there? That's my first thought. But, I, but after I think that first thought, I think, you know, a lot of times these things are really emotionally packed. They're so emotionally packed that sometimes it's hard. You know, Tammy and I have been there. It's really hard to leave a church when you have all these relationships and you have all of these things going on. It becomes emotionally packed. And keep in mind, Satan uses that. He uses that. But back to our point here, back to our point, verse 9, there's no longer any prophet. That's one of the source aspects of this is that the Word of God is not being proclaimed The hope that comes from the Word of God is not being proclaimed. The gospel is not being shared. God's Word, His covenants are not being being proclaimed. Verse 10, how long is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Again, calling back to the fact that God's being dishonored. He's being defamed by what's going on here. In verse 11, he says, why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Now, the Hebrew is difficult in some of these verses, but it appears that what is going on here is God is kind of like standing like this, watching. You notice I have both hands in my pockets. And they're saying, Lord, take your right hand out of your pocket, out of the fold of your garment, if you will. Take your right hand out of your pocket. And what is the right hand? The right hand is an emblem of strength and might and power. Take your hand out of your pocket and silence these people who are defaming defaming your holy name. How radically different this prayer sounds than many of our own prayers, doesn't it? How often have we prayed that way recently? This is what Bonhoeffer is pointing to. This is what Luther was pointing to. Let's Let's let the Lord teach us how to pray with these prayers that we have Psalms. Now, in verse 12 through 18, we have the singer giving way to a hymn. You see the word yet in ESV, the word yet there in verse 12. It's like the psalmist is bringing his lament before God. He's describing what has happened. And then he's like, all right, let's set this aside. Let's go back to the basics. Let's get back to the basics here. What are the basics here? Verse 12, yet God, my king, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. In other words, my God is a savior. Lord, you have shown yourself. Your resume is chock full of the fact that you are a saving God. You are a savior, Lord. You're a savior. So he's filling himself full again, if you will, of the things that he knows about God. Verses 13, 14, you divided the sea By your might, you broke the heads of the sea monster on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him his food for the creatures of the wilderness. Now we say, wow, what is the mother of three praying in these lines? What has a sea monster got to do with teenagers in the home? Well, some of us might answer that right away. 
these are like, these are land monsters versus sea monsters. Uh, Tammy, I hope you don't mind me saying it, but she used to say that kids should go from 11 to 25. Just go from 11 to 25. We mean no disrespect to any teenagers here, but just go from 11 to 25. Tammy has since revised that from 11 to 40, I think, is the current <laughs> revision, um, with more, probably more revision to come. <laughs> just all joking aside, you know, um, what is this language of sea monsters and this language of Leviathan? What is all of this? Well, scholars, are, scholars divide. Some scholars will say, and some of your study Bibles will say, well, this points to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is destroyed in the Red Sea. And Isaiah comes out and calls Pharaoh a dragon, if you will, a dracon. Um, uh, other translations could say sea monster. Uh, there was... Uh, there are other scholars that say, no, what this is pointing to is this ancient folklore in the ancient Near East that was, that was heralded by um, uh, pagan philosophy and pagan religion that described these uh, seven-headed sea monsters that were always warring with the false gods, if you will. They didn't call them false gods, but they were at war with the gods, if you will, lowercase g-o-d-s, and they were constantly at battle, and the seven-headed sea monster represented evil and chaos, and the gods were always fighting always fighting, but I think what, what, what we have here is this constant battle, but the gods are never winning. And um, the Scriptures pick this up. I mean, just as I've used Gordon Lightfoot's lyrics of the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, the, the, the singer's picking these, these popular things up, and what is he, what is he saying? The, the meaning of this text is that um, God is might is such that he can destroy any foe that comes up against him, even these so-called seven-headed sea monsters, if you will. But they go one step further. Scripture actually goes further to re describe folks like Pharaoh as one of these dragons, if you will, uh, as one of these dragons. So I don't do the either or. I don't argue back and forth because I see how so easily both can be the case here. This idea of dragon and sea monster is not coming out of a vacuum. It's coming out of culture. Now, how does mom pray for this? Well, that's why we read from Revelation chapter 12. The angels make war with who? With Satan, who is what? That ancient dragon. See, behind all of this warfare is still the same foe today. How's Mother 3 pray these verses? Oh, my goodness, these are as relative today as they were then. Because this dragon is seeking to destroy your cubs. He is seeking to destroy your children. And what is the psalmist doing? He is reminding himself that even Pharaoh couldn't stand up to God, nor could any, even you imagine the most powerful creature that you can imagine. That would be Satan, perhaps. He can't stand up to God as he seeks to destroy our children. Let us always remind ourselves he cannot, there is no creature, no creature that can stand up to our God. Amen? That's important. You see the, the, you see the strength that he's getting from this hymn? You, verse 15, you split open springs and brooks. You dried up the uh, ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also the night. You've established the heavenly lights and the sun. God determines when the sun shines in a given ge ge geographic location, and he determines when it goes down. Who else does that? I mean, sometimes we'd like to. We'd like to have a little more daylight because we're not done with our work. But there isn't anybody that can make that happen, is there? God does. He sets the boundaries. You see the strength that the you see that the strength that uh, that that the singer and the congregation are getting here in verse um, seventeen. You've fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You've made summer and winter. Now in verse eighteen, in verse eighteen we have a number of petitions here. In verse eighteen, the psalmist says, "Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs and a foolish people reviles your name." You know, at the heart of the singer's, I put a note here, at the heart of the singer's petition is the glory of God, which the singer uses as a powerful argument for God to act. His glory is on the line, as I've already been saying uh, several times here. And in, uh, uh, in addition to that, let's think about this for a moment. 
How many times is the name of the Lord going to be scoffed today in our own culture? As we think about this petition, do we, do we ever in our prayer life, do we ever say, Lord, how long is this scoffing gonna, of your name going to continue? I'm afraid that our prayers are probably void of that, aren't they? I know many of mine are void of that. You hear my prayers every Sunday and Wednesday night. But how long is it going to continue? How long is Jesus' holy and precious name going to be continued to be pushed through the dirt as it has done day in and day out? Here we see the psalmist says, Lord, remember it. A foolish people reviles your name. You know, where's foolish coming from? The fool says in his heart, there's no God. Doesn't he? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Verse 19, do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Notice they're referred to as wild beasts. Now, there's a distinction we need to make when we're studying the Psalms. Because some of us say, wait a second, how do we, how do we, how do we pray like this? with the words of Jesus on our lips, that we should pray for our enemies. How do we keep both of those together? Well, we're to do both. We're to pray for our enemies. But who is the ultimate enemy here? The ultimate enemy here is the one who is never going to come to faith and repentance, who is going to push back against God until the very end. We don't know who those people are. We don't. But that does not change the fact that God is being defamed. We need to keep both of these together. This is not an either-or thing. You see, it's a little more complex than that. We want to pray for the salvation. You see, the scoffing stops two ways. One, with the destruction of the enemy, of course. But two, and more importantly, with his or her salvation. Does that make sense? So first and foremost, we want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ, don't we? Then the scoffing stops, doesn't it? But until then, God's name is being drugged through the dirt. A foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Notice how the psalmist speaking, the singer speaking for the congregation, they refer to themselves as a dove. Imagine a dove just sitting in the forest surrounded by a pack of wolves. What chance does the dove have? You know, it's a picture of humility. It's a picture where... You know what, Lord, in the midst of this, these foes are so powerful. I'm like a dove in the midst of a pack of wolves here. How does the mother of three pray this line? Guess what? We can't always be everywhere our children are, can we? We can't be everywhere our children are at. We can't protect them from everything that we'd like to protect them from. Sometimes we fall in where we think we're going to do it. If you think you're going to do that, oftentimes you're going to end up becoming controlling and you're going to make yourself and you're going to make your kids a big mess because you just can't. The psalmist is leading us here. We're like doves, especially in the world's eye. We seem to be so powerless. And, you know, even as Luther says in his hymn, on earth there's no equal. No equal to who? No equal to Satan. None of us are equal to him in terms of intellect, in terms of power, in terms of anything. We're not equal to him in any way. But there's something the world forgets. There's something the world doesn't understand about mom, who is the mother bear of these three cubs. She prays. She prays. It was said of John Knox that uh, Mary was more afraid of John Knox's prayers than any army the earth could produce at that time. So be careful with mom because she prays. She appears to be a dove. And in many respects, she is. And this goes for dad, too. Do you see how this works? It's a a posture of humility, and it's a posture of dependence upon God. Lord, I I can't do this thing. I'm going to trust it to you. And I am going to entrust that you are working in the lives of my children. You're working in the lives of my family. Whatever that problem might be, Lord, do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Suddenly, this prayer becomes alive. Suddenly, I'm like, I feel like I could pray this now. Well, go ahead. I won't mind. Bow your head and pray because this is really powerful stuff. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Look at verse 20. Have regard for the covenant 
for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. As I recall, in 1985, when we went on our senior trip, we went into the airport, we tossed our baggage on the little gizmo, and we walked right straight onto a plane. Could you imagine that? Say, what? I don't remember any TSA agents being there at all. I just don't. Maybe they were. I don't know. But I don't even remember a wand going over us. Uh, seems to me my memory could be wrong. It was a long time ago. But we walked into the airport, we tossed our baggage off, we got straight on the plane. Now, some of you would be like, what? Well, this, these United States have become much more dangerous since then, progressively so. So much so that what do we see on the news almost all the time? We see a shooting almost all the time. Look at this verse. The land, the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. That's one of the things that's causing so much anxiety today. We can sit and worry about this, but the fact is that worrying is not going to change it a bit. Or we can choose to put our faith and our trust in the Lord. We we'll say, Lord, you're the only one that can protect us. And even if something should happen, let us understand that's part of your plan. It's part of your plan. But in back of all of this, disregard for God, as we saw last week, and, you know, um, how do I put it in my notes? I put it in my notes away, which I, I wrote it down because I, I thought to myself, you're going to forget. Um, I have a note here. When man exalts himself over God, that's it. When man exalts himself over God, violence is never far behind because lawlessness will prevail. I didn't trust my memory to hold on to that, and for good reason, it didn't. But think about that for a minute. When man exalts himself over God, violence is never far behind because lawlessness prevails. You can take that to the bank. And when we, when we, when we begin to digest that truth, we begin to see that many of the talking points of our leaders and media are going to fail because they haven't a clue, one, about the nature of this violence. Oh, we're going to do this, or we're going to do this. No, we're going to do this policy. We're going to do this. You know what? You're, you're going to kick the can down the road is all you're going to do, and it's going to be worse because this is above us. This is above our pay grade here. This battle that's ensuing is a cosmic battle. What's Paul say? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the authorities and the powers and the principalities of the air. This is a cosmic battle. And when you listen to the news and stuff, if you, if you care to do so, I try to do enough that I have a little bit of an idea of what's going on. But you listen to that, and a man's going to solve it. You know, he's just going to solve it. There's this rising star in this, parlor, in this party that's going to solve it. Now, I'm not saying this is unimportant because it is important to have good leaders, but they're not going to solve this problem. I don't care who they are. The only one that can solve this problem is the one who has solved this problem, and it's Christ. So any remedy that we try to prescribe to our culture that is without Christ is going to make it worse. It's not going to make it better because we are exalting our own wisdom. We're exalting our own understanding. We're exalting ourselves above God's written word, aren't we? That will always be the case. A couple more things and I'll wrap up. Look at verse 21. Do not let the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. You know, the poor and needy can praise your name as you bring deliverance. Verse 22, arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all day. Notice this word, remember. We have the word for do not forget, that phrase, if you will, also a phrase of remembering. And it forms a, a set of bookends with verse 2. Verse 2 said, remember. Remember your con congregation. Remember your dove. Remember the people of your heritage. You see this? The singer representing the people says, Lord, remember us. Don't forget us. Don't let us be devoured. These foolish people are scoffing at you all the day long. I think what we would say with the light of the New Testament, we'd say, Lord, convert them. Convert them, O oh Father, or hang them by their own noose, which is how we prayed today, isn't it? Amen? Let's end on a positive note. This great hymn in verses 12 through 18, I think is the hymn that we want to really leave here today with. Our God is powerful. Our God is a Savior. There is no foe that can run up against Him and destroy Him. There's no foe that can run up against Him 
and destroy what he is doing, regardless of what it appears to, to look like. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this great psalm. It's lengthy and it requires a lot of mental energy to get through. But Father, I trust that, Lord, you'll cause these words to reverberate in our hearts that next time we turn to it, Father, we may see how we can pray these things and how these things are so relevant to uh, us all. We are not theocratic Israel. We are not Israel in covenant with you by way of the Mosaic covenant. But Father, we see the principles and the truths of this psalm and how they, they apply to your church. And we think, oh, Father, of your church. There's so much that could be said about your church, Father. You know, many of our churches today look like civic centers and are, seem to be much more after the thumbprint of a Fortune 500 plan than the churches of old, which were beautiful. And they, they, they really projected the holiness and majesty and awe of our God. Oh, Lord, help us, oh, Lord. For we see that today, Lord, there's many places where your word is not taught. We see, Father, we could go down through all, all day long and see how this psalm applies. We can see how it applies to parenting, Father. Oh, Lord, put these words in our hearts that we may pray them back to you, oh, Father. That, Lord, you may hear these things as a pleasing sound in your ears. And, that, Father, you will act, you will protect, and you'll continue to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our concluding song.